It's small but highly effective. <laughs> Hello there, I'm Greg and I'm making a modified Neutrona wand with a custom display stand inspired by Ghostbusters. <laughs> De -de 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 Ghostbusters. I love Ghostbusters, always have. Failed to learn piano because my lessons clashed with the real Ghostbusters cartoon being on TV. Uh, and she had weird wallpaper, but that's by the by. So I love Ghostbusters. It's the lightning in a bottle movie, isn't it? It could never happen now. Weird tone. Then a couple of years ago, Ghostbusters Afterlife was about to come out and they released a very accurate replica. It's not a toy. <laughs> It's all toys. Uh, an adult toy? No, that's not right. Adam Savage at Tested did a number of videos from the set and they had one comparing the screen prop with the, the Spengler Neutrona wand. So I could see all the little changes and upgrades you would have to make if you were to rather extravagantly buy yourself one, which I did. I don't buy many replicas, but this one, absolutely no regrets. It's a wonderful thing to hold. So I'm afraid a lot of this was done off camera well, not off camera, before camera, because it was back before this YouTube venture was even a, a twinkle in my eye. So we're going to start with a recap of all the changes I've already made. <sighs> the cat says meow. I think he thinks it's time to go. Let's go. So this is the base that it comes with. This was all this grey plastic. I cut the ends off, replaced them with these projector parts. Coloured it all in silver just with a chrome pen for now. Reinforced the base with two bits of wood because it was a bit bent down in the middle. This welding is all just hot glue. These are light fixture parts because it had these plasticky leg things. And I don't know, I don't really like those. I'm keeping, I'm keeping them as bits, but I don't really know what they're for. So I've kept these, lined these with little strips of foam mat which has a nice pattern to it that's the foot thing that came with it scraped off the Ghostbusters logo and then these rubber things are wine bottle stoppers then I've got this nice old piece of wood varnished it and I've stuck foam feet on the bottom so it doesn't slide and it's slightly raised up so we're going to attach that to there and just decorate it a bit with this box of stuff this is the light fixture that the the legs came from obviously saving those because they're kind of cool got some little plastic handles, some car headlight bulbs, some old camera projector parts, these kind of legs I'm thinking of maybe using but I'm not sure, that's a metal heat sink, these are LED dog collars, old headphone speakers that I've had for years and years and years, parts from a toy microscope, just nice little knobs, that's like a spirit level from a camera projector, that's some kind of nozzle, that's an old guitar pickup, and these which I think are old bed springs that I kept because I like the fact that the rust, the rust is real. Oh, and then these, which are also off the camera equipment that I took apart, which are just metal and they've got numbers and grids on them. Bit of an old towel rack. And the Dymo label, which is a must, Neutrona wand. So let's get detailing. So you've gathered your bits, you've brought in the sheaves, and now we're just arranging. I'm very much arranging them in the final configuration that I use, so I suspect I'd already made lots of decisions and now I'm just sort of faking. <laughs> Does that go there? Hmm. But yeah, so I, I cut off the bits of the stand they give you that I didn't like. There were some pointy bits that I've covered with these Meccano pieces. And then that old vent from a, a film projector is just a thing I've had for years that I really like. And all the speckly rust on it is real. So there's real rust, and then later there'll be some fake rust. So, said Meccano pieces are slightly too high to fit over. You know, their sides are too tall. Um, to put over there, so I'm just creating a sort of buffer zone with some strips of styrene to boost it up, like putting beer mats under a, a wobbly table leg, um, and a piece of ribbed rubber. So again, it looks like suspension. It's all kind of motivated. Spirit levels to kind of tell you whether it's level or not. It seems to have some sort of science-y meaning. So yeah, a strip of this ribbed rubber, um, realise it could be wider, and then the whole thing is held down with a piece of Meccano, Wood screws, a sin in Star Wars world, but I think um, Egon Spengler wouldn't be, wouldn't be past a wood screw if he's putting something on a wooden base. And then these, I think I call these camera projector parts, several times in the video. It's actually fo a photo enlarger that was going to be thrown out at the uni where I used to work. So the little, the, the spirit levels and these numbers and a few knobs and things come from that. Okay, flashing lights. This is another of my LED dog collars. 
So just popping out the gizmo from inside and it's a nicely contained bulb, battery and light that you just need to push. But I need to create a housing for it. So I'm going through my round bits, I've got a Sabutio base, a nozzle, some other nozzle, some buttons off an old CD player. Once you take the dome off, the, the, the connector's quite flimsy on the bulb, so it needs to be in some sort of hoose. This thing, it's... I don't know what it is. It's in my bit box. It's a red button off maybe a toy CD player, maybe a laser gun, but past me knew. Past me knew it had its uses. And it even has little uh, ridges inside which push the, the bulb down, so it physically works really well. So here I'm just using a, an emery board. This emery board is giving me a rash, what song is that from? To sand the bulb, because if you make it opaque then it diffuses the light better. Then same thing again, I've just used a nail file to very carefully, or you will detach the bulb, uh, flatten the head of it. So it was domed and now I've just flattened it down. Now, I bought some large drill bits, but none of them were quite the right size of large, so lots of holes with a drill, and then I just used my Dremel to make the hole exactly the right size for this thing. Sawdust and circuit boards. Oh, it's all sawdust and circuit boards. That can't be a good combo. Anyway, just mounted the red light cover Fresnel bulb thing on a piece of the same toy microscope that the two silver knobs on the front of the base come from, so it all kind of matches. Weathering. This thing's been clean silver for far too long. Uh, everything in Afterlife, particularly, is really, probably overly destroyed. I don't know how busy Egon was in his final years, spoiler. Um, but yeah, things are really rusty, dusty, scratched and knackered. So yeah, this is just brown and burnt umber, no, black and burnt umber, acrylic paint mixed with water. Tilt, tilt your wet palette so you can use thick paint or watery paint. That's my, um, that's the Johnson technique. Put it on, wipe it off. And here, this is very precise for weathering, but I've bought some fine brushes, so I may as well use them. I'm just really making sure it gets into all those cracks and crannies, because um, if you sort of brush it over but it doesn't go down into the recesses, it looks unrealistic. It needs to get down in all, in all them creases. And then I'm dabbing it off with a cotton bud, or Q-tip. Bilingual. You'd think this was my Halloween special, but we're not there yet. A couple of weeks. So yeah, I generally think of weathering as an enjoyably sloppy process, but actually this, just making sure it gets into all the little bits. It's a bit precious, but it's nice to go around and just hit the edges. Speaking of which, so on my uh, Mandalorian gun, or indeed on the Neutrino ones you'll see in a bit, they're black things that I hit silver along the edges of. So I just thought, why don't I hit black along the edges of a silver thing? And I really like it. Anything that's just solid silver has a danger of just being a sort of flat, grey, shiny blob. So it just brings out the edges. Oh, there he is. Uh, so just back from lunch, ham, cheese and pickle bagel. Uh, the weathering, I think, is done. The brown and black wash. Uh, you can't see because we're incredibly brightly lit, getting half half tanned today. Uh, the little light is now a self-contained and slightly weathered unit. Pleased with that. So, it's time to use some dirty down rust for the purpose that it's intended for, i.e. a rust effect. The thing you are supposed to do with this stuff is warm the bottle and also warm the surface you're going to put it on because when you apply it, it magically there's a little thing to make the metallics mix up. Um, it magically turns into a rust effect before your very eyes. But I'm going to test it first. Actually, I'm not going to test it first. Let's just go for it. Yeah, so this is pretty wild stuff. So just watch this. It goes from the brown varnish that I used on my Mandalorian blaster handle to this genuinely oxidised orange rust. It's really realistic. It's really good. So I'm just applying it. Sorry, my mouth is very near the mic, so sorry if this is a bit ASMR. Uh, I'm just applying it on the hot glue that's meant to look like a weld, because that's where things go rusty. You see how that, that colour change? It's actually going, that pale orangey-yellow. That's magic. That's so good. Another great Christmas present. I mean, it's quite ridiculous how delightful this stuff is to use. I can't tell you how much... I'm loving it. 
I'm loving it. If overusing this stuff is a problem, then um, that's what I have to guard against because everything from now on is rust belts all the way. It creates effects that you can't quite plan, which is really nice because it takes some of the sort of decision making out of your hands and just surprises you and gives everything this sort of diving bell, neglected, mottled patina. But it makes bolder choices than you would. So you get these bright yellows and bright oranges and yeah, it's braver than me. <laughs> it's braver than me and, um, and for that I love it very much. I somehow overlooked this shot in my original shoot, so I'm now out of costume. But yeah, dust pass. Speaking of being brave, I'm just scratching terracotta, bright orange, brown, a darker grey brown, chalk pastels all over the thing and then dusting it off. Just takes the shine off anywhere that's still a bit shiny. <laughs> you get the idea. Dust pass. Good morning. It's day two. The base is done. Yes, I think the base is done. It's weathered, it's flashing, it's all very lovely. So, I thought I'd better do a video about what changes I've made to the wand. Let's start at the front. That's a very good place to start. Never get tired of that. There it is. You can see why I bought it. It vibrates. I mean, no, come on. So first up, the barrel. When this replica comes, the barrel is just plain smooth plastic, it's clear with a, a white tube underneath to diffuse the LEDs. But if you look at the screen used prop, it has these kind of nice ridged bits and, and weathered patches in between. So I looked online for can you get thick uh, clear tape and I've discovered that there's a thing called helicopter tape which is just that and it's sticky tape that's thick and clear. So I put two bands of that on. I'm in my sanding, oh there it is. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the joints were invisible, but I just I hadn't found them yet. There's the joints. So, but I did sand it underneath. I also used some clear uh, lacquer to make it sort of lumpy and just add some texture. Then I sanded these patches in between by putting two strips of masking tape to protect there, and then just sanded it with with wire wool. And I've rubbed in some brown uh, pastel, like chalk pastel. This end has a sort of cap, which isn't on the prop. And this also had a very rounded end, like the bottom of a test tube. So I sanded the tip flat to the point that I actually put a little hole in it. But I filled that with, again, uh, with crystal lacquer, just like clear, clear plastic lacquer. Moving on to the grip, I've done quite a bit of seam removal by sanding. So I'm going to do a bit more sanding on that today just to get rid of that ridge. And I've coloured it in, uh, again, with chalk pastels and pencil crayons and just all sorts of dusty browns to make it look old and then coloured in the three nuts with my liquid chrome pen. Sanded it all over so it's weathered and matte. Today I'm going to do a repaint and re-weathering of all the silver chipping because they kind of they did their best but it's I want to do it slightly more precisely. Then I read because I got into the sort of um, Ghostbuster replica prop forum world as soon as i'd read that the the clipard minimatic this thing on the replica prop is for some reason too small i thought yo oh, yeah that bugs me so then you go down an etsy hole and you find out oh you can buy them made out of resin so i've replaced the clipard minimatic when i was putting these two slightly more screen accurate screws through it to hold it onto here it did break the resin broke there so that white patch is uh, is plasto that i just put over the crack then the join i filled in with super glue and Baking soda, again, coloured the end in with liquid chrome. Another accuracy thing, I'm not usually much of an accuracy sort of freak, but um, once you've read that the stickers and decals aren't quite right, and that you can buy slightly more accurate stickers and decals online, then I bought them. And then the most famously not screen nice thing about this replica uh, was the handle. In the movie, it's wrapped in olive drab canvas tape, which they did, you know, a pretty good job of replicating, but it's too chunky, it's not the right material, and you can do it better with real tape. So, when you remove this, there's a gap here in the handle. It suddenly occurred to me, well, this is a very malleable, soft, carvable material, why don't I just carve the handle shape that I need out of the rubbery plastic that's already there? I've still, I think, got a bit of dremeling and carving to do just to sort of level that out before I put the tape around, but that will come after painting. Also, there's more seam removal all the way around. There's a seam in there that I can't quite reach. 
and you can't quite see. So let's not worry about it. There's one down the side of the barrel, which is annoying. And if you can get rid of it, then you do, don't you? There, for example, there was a hard seam line across the middle of that flat panel, which shouldn't be there. So what I did was scumble it all over with a very, very fine layer of super glue, just to give it this slightly hammered, slightly battered texture, and then just sand it, sand it, sand it, sand it. One drawback of that is that now this cannot be opened. This door cannot be opened. What film is that from? So for example, because I can't open up the body of it, the one change I've decided not to make is this three-part lozenge-shaped window grill. It's a grill. Shouldn't have this clear um, plastic in it. It should just be a hole straight into the body of the thing. I personally prefer it being a light. And also, if I dremel or drill that out, it's just a lot of dust and, and catastrophe raining down into the body of the, the beast and I can't get it out because I've now sanded it all the, the seams and stuff shut and I think I prefer that being a light. I think I just do. Last thing, this grilled piece on the side is a, an aluminium heat sink. When it comes it has right angled corners along the top and bottom but I noticed that on the movie prop they're rounded. Dreamly because it's being handled by a lot of 12 year olds and you know they're very sharp. I also think it looks nicer. So again just went around with my Dremel and rounded by hand all those corners. So today we're re-blacking this, removing the stickers, and then putting different stickers back on. Yes, it's worth it, let's do it. For example, that sticker there is more like that sticker there. So, you know, I'm not obsessive about details being right or anything usually, but <laughs> let's make it right though. It's not screen accurate, but it's okay in the words of Whitney Houston. So what we're doing here, it's already a bit sanded and smooth, but I'm taking off the stickers. Then I thought, well, I may as well just sand a bit more. So I'm using very fine uh, wet and dry sandpaper because I think I went in with some sort of 40 grit uh, back in the day. So it really is scratched to smithereens. One of my catchphrase words. Peeling off the sticker, side to side motion. If you really want to get your best shot at getting a label off clean, these stickers are actually fine, but you don't pull straight, you waggle it, you waggle it. And then I'm just using an emery board and then damping it down with a lemony wet wipe. And his series of unfortunate events. Right, the pump handle. I'd done quite a lot of seam removal, but I hadn't quite gone all the way. So there was still a slight, a clicky, a clicky ridge that you could just feel. So again, I'm just going in with the rough side of a store-bought consumer quality nail file and just sanding over the seams where a seam shouldn't he be. <clears throat> I sound like I was going to burst into tears. <laughs> where a seam shouldn't be. Flat black. Let's do some painting. So what are we doing here? We're removing the stickers, decals and weathering, painting it black and then putting them back. Here I am. Just a quick note to say, this matte black paint is really lovely. When you first take the lid off, and you, the medium, I think, has all risen to the top, so it looks kind of pale blue, even when you paint it on. It has a slightly pale blue tone to it. But yeah, when it's dry, it's matte as anything. It looks like black rubber or something. It's really matte. So good for them. Well done, plastic coat. Please sponsor me. <laughs> Wood grain. Let's go heavy. For the first pass, I'm using my gomji bar just to scratch into the paint and the plastic and the pastel crayon and the whatever else I put on there when I was two years younger and just so carefree. And now that wasn't enough apparently, so I'm just going in with a, a craft knife, carving like an absolute madman, holding it like a pen. So not by the handle like you would cut normally, I'm literally holding it in a pen for better control. These lines look very ridged chips at the moment, but you just sand off all the raised detritus that's come up out of the groove there and um, trust the process. Applying some stickers. I mean, <laughs> it's like video of heart surgery or something. Like it's so, is it, is it straight? Is it straight? But yeah, very satisfying. Just getting it slightly right. As I say, I'm not a rightness obsessive, but having a picture of the screen used prop in front of you and thinking, oh yeah, that looks like that, is it's nice. I figured you line up the word danger with the 
bottom of the that ridge that's under the silver knob. You can see I know all the technical terms. Introducing a guest star, Pippa Strell. That's herself. Uh, just noticed that that button was red and it isn't on the toy. Toy. Okay, so I got these more accurate decals. Haven't put a decal or transfer, as you used to call them, onto anything with a pencil. I'm using a coloured pencil because it's slightly softer than a lead pencil. For years and years, it's, you know, nerve-wracking, but like many nerve-wracking things, when it turns out that it went right, it is really satisfying. These are from Ecto Labs. Again, when I see a sort of forum entry or something on Facebook, hello to the Ghostbusters proton pack replica making group on Facebook, when I see a thing saying, these decals are more accurate, you know, I tend to click through and keep clicking until I've bought some. So again, notice that that orange knob on top of the toy, toy replica, toy plica. The big orange knob on top of the toy plica just wasn't right. It's a flat button. So I tipped out my round things bit box and found one that's a couple of mil too big, but it's fine. So I'm just colouring it in with an orange Sharpie and then to make it look clear, this really worked, just hit the very edge with a red Sharpie. So it has a red detail just around that top edge because you're always highlighting or turning up contrast and making sure the shapes of things really pop. So I've put hot glue in the hole and super glue on the back of the button and place and hold and rub off all the sharpie with your thumb but you can just redo it. So here using dirty down rust not for what it's intended for but just the the stuff at the top as a clear varnish. Thanks to the gift of capillary action uh, you put a couple of drops into those grooves and it just sucks it down the groove to make sure that all those lines again like with weathering the base are dark because if they're pale in there it just doesn't look right. So, movie prop on screen, and that's my plain black painted toy plica that we're now going to re-weather, because we're very precious about our weathering and we like to do it ourselves. <laughs> Another nice thing about having the prop on screen in front of you is it gives you license to go in very heavy, because as I've said before, these things have to read on screen, so the, the weathering is not subtle. Made a bit of a revelation at this point, it's best not to draw the line, dot the line, and then you get a line with a lot more texture and depth and interest and it, it's higher res. When my wife saw the finished prop, she said, yeah, it looks like you've just bought a higher res version of the thing you already had. So we're making it 4K, 8K, 10K. <laughs> so now I've done the heavy duty silver linings with, uh, with my liquid chrome pen and a little bit of the, the duller silver sharpie as well. So now I'm subtleifying here. I've got my references up on, on screen and I'm using this. I mean, it's barely even a brush. It's completely uh, splayed, but it's really good for creating slightly random. Random's a, a clumsy word, but slightly surprising scuffed marks that you can use to soften all these edges and just do a bit of actual soft dry brushing here where you just sort of catch it like that and it stops the lines being quite so cartoonishly colored in so anywhere now when I look at it and I think oh that's that's a big silver line drawn with a pen just scuffle the edges a bit with this what is it it's sort of a a mop a mop disaster it's a scratch brush I'm gonna call it a scratch brush I'm gonna I'm gonna patent them and sell them for a fortune oh that's too much the only problem is sometimes the silver is a bit thick, so that if the silver's chunky, it spoils the illusion of being underneath the black paint. Also with this one, you can scuff it actually dry and then just do some dotty dusting just to make the black less black and we're getting it up to a dark gray silver because it's not really black. So a live and not at all staged getting out of my tape box shot. And then we go in for a close up. So this cloth tape, I can't remember what tape it's called. I remember it was 13 quid. So when you sort of, uh, you go into a bit of a fugue stage and you think, am I really clicking by? Am I? And you've clicked it, too late. Anyway, while I was waffling, I noticed, so I've already wrapped the gap in the handle with black electrical tape to basically save myself some of this quite expensive um, olive drab cloth tape, but also to create a softer, surface for the cloth tape to stick to. 
and then once that feels tightly stuck into the finger gaps, I also brushed the inside of those arches with super glue just to really hold it in because it's not the stickiest tape in the world. It's also not entirely the right shade of green, so I'm just um, shaving on some palish green chalk pastel and then brushing it off with a toothbrush. More weathering. So now I think we've come to the final pass. Your scratches are too silver. They all look like you bought a shop fresh Neutrona wand, went out on an incredibly eventful bust and came back and all those scratches happened today to your nice new black particle thrower. Neutrona wand if you're nasty. Those scratches need to look old, so you paint your brown and black over them, dab it off again, lemony wet wipe, you know the drill. So this knob, the knurling, K-N-U-R-L, the knurling around the outside of that knob um, really needs to get black into it for it to look authentically old, so I'm just caking it in black paint and then sort of handling it and doing what you would do if you used that knob. And anywhere that isn't silver, buff it back. Buff it back to health. And I believe the job is done. We have the tools, we have the talent. We have the toys, we have the talent. So that, my friends, is that. Uh, very proud of it. It's a lovely thing to have sitting on your shelf. I'm a big fan of Ghostbusters Afterlife. I love the wooden handle, I love the tape, and I love the film, I think. It's less of a comedy, but I explained it to my nephews as it's The Force Awakens for Ghostbusters. Yeah? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What was that music you just heard? Back in the day I used to sometimes pretend to be a Belgian, semi-Belgian, quasi-Belgian action star called Lunge Dolphin, and he did an album, very obscure and unloved album, of movie song parodies. So that was a hopefully non-copyright infringing, because they're famously litigious, uh, version of the Ghostbusters theme. The idea I had was it was The Exorcist meets Ghostbusters, so it's a bunch of ghostbusting priests. It's long enough ago that I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> it also has a rap in the middle, which is a parody of Thriller. So it, it's too many things at once. It's too many things at once. It's inaccessible comedy that's for almost no one. But yeah, it's online somewhere, if you're interested. Today's YouTube channel recommendation is Punished Props. They taught me a lot about weathering and props and they're just a really nice company. So if you like long hanging out in a workshop videos, which I hope you do, because you're still here, watch them. Call to action. This episode's call to action. Like, share and subscribe is too many things. I'm going to pick one. Please like this video. Just hit the thumbs up and like it. That's all. Don't share it with anyone and God help you if you subscribe to my channel. And as always, huge gratitude. Quite grovelly. I could get down on my knees but then I wouldn't be in shot. Grovelling thanks uh, to my Patreons, including my patrons, not Patreons. Patreons! Uh, thank you, Patreons. You give me a reason to keep going. You know, you have those days where you think, oh, does anyone care? Or I used to, now I don't, because I have a Patreon. So I go there and there's a list of people. Daryl McLean, Ann Johnson, most but not all, Chris Graham, Jack Fallows, Crob Edmonds, Simon Vaughan, Eric Gordon, Ian McHugh, Greg Paul, Chris Lackey, Jerry DeVetta, Jeremy Imsen, Alton Scott, Chris Whitworth, John Rinderfjall, Blue Gnu, Custard Waffler, Christian Haunter, and Tuesday M. Love you. Those people care. And it keeps you going and making things. And, um... Yeah, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Please consider joining. Uh, lots more good stuff on the way. What else? Raise the cult books. I was wearing it the whole time. That's the twist. Thanks for watching. Lots of love and I'll see you soon.
a real deep voice Or makes a weird pig noise Call a priest And if a head spins round All the way round That's too far round Sweet 13 has a good blaspheme And she's bringing up green, it's a messed up scene When it ain't no fun, cause she talks in tongues And insults your mum, got a problem, John When the air's all cold, round your 12-year-old And she looks like death, and she has a 